Good evening. Um, <laughs> my name is Dr. Harold Isaacs, um, and I'm Professor Emeritus of History here at Georgia Southwestern. This is, I'm beginning my 43rd year here. So, uh, anyhow, what I want to do is uh, take this opportunity to welcome you to uh, the Third World Series. This is our 27th year. Uh, we started this on February 18th, 1981. And uh, there are some people in this room that were there then, including Mr. Neil Turner up here. And it was something, uh, major developments in the Caribbean and the Middle East and, Af and uh, Southeast Asia. And most of those colleagues are not here anymore. So, but from there, uh, we've continued that series and this, uh, Involved into the Association of Third World Studies in 1983, which is, um, we founded it here at Georgia Southwestern. Uh, now we're, we're all over the world, really. We have about uh, 450 members and we have several chapters. And um, in fact, our 25th annual meeting is going to be in Lima, Peru, November 18th. 20. And um, I think we have something like 45 panels for that meeting. So uh, and if you would like to go, there's still an opportunity. We'll, we'll make an exception, uh, even though the deadline is passed for proposals. Uh, we also established the Journal of Third World Studies, and um, which is an outstanding uh, periodical on third world problems and issues. Okay, well, we've can, this university has a lot of emphasis on third world studies. I think I got my point across. Um, I want to thank you for attending. We, uh, I mentioned Mr. Turner and Ms. Lopez here. I always recognize, uh, especially people from the community, and Lillian Lopez and Mary Faye Dudley. And then I see our president over here with his wife, Connie, Dr. Blanchard. Thank you for coming. Thanks for your support. We appreciate it. And same with David Garrison, our Dean of Arts and Science. So thank you for your support. And we have the panel up here, Dr. Hall, and Dr. Smith, Dr. Parkinson, Dr. Smedder, and Dr. Cooper. So um, we have a pretty hot issue here, uh, subject. Tonight, are the Iraqi people better off now than <coughs> under Saddam Hussein? Well, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not a participant. And uh, so I, I, I was talking to my, I talked to my wife about it on the way over. In fact, my wife's over there, Doris, and uh, I appreciate your support. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm gonna, we'll go on with the program here. We have, uh, we have four featured speakers, and then the respondent is Dr. Cooper. Um, first speaker is Dr. Hall, who is professor of history here at GSW. He's a specialist in Eastern European history. But he, he really knows world history. He's written a few books on Bulgaria and, and the Balkans. He participates in a lot of conferences and teaches a variety of courses. And um, um, Dr. Hall is going to talk, his subject is overview of Iraq and the Iraqi war. So Richard, welcome once again. Thank you, Dr. Isaac. So what I thought I'd do tonight is give a little background to these events. Uh, the history of what is now Iraq is long, uh, going back 5,000 years, but the actual state 
is a fairly recent innovation. The origins of Iraq lie in the imperial aspirations of Great Britain, which were uh, manifested during the First World War in an agreement with the French. This was called the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1915. And the British indicated that after the successful conclusion of the First World War, after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, the British wanted to control three specific billets or provinces of the Ottoman Empire. These were in the north of Mosul, where there was known to be deposits of, of petroleum, in the center of Baghdad, and in the south, Basra, in order to have a firmer grip uh, on the Persian Gulf and thus ensure that the British could maintain their communications uh, with their uh, important imperial possession in India. Well, after the war, beginning in 1918, the British took control of this region, but they found the going rough. They found that they could not impose an overall control easily, so they decided by 1932 to pull out and to leave a surrogate in charge. This was a member of a local Arab diocese, the Hashemite family. Uh, the British also put the Hashemites in charge of the neighboring uh, region of Transjordan. Uh, and the Hashemite kingdom of Iraq then uh, was established, 1932, as I said. Well, within the next nine years, British uh, surrogate were shaken there when, of all things, a pro-Nazi government came to power in Baghdad. Uh, and for a time, there appeared to be the danger uh, that this government would somehow link up uh, with the oncoming forces of Rommel, uh, who was at the gates of Egypt. That didn't transpire, uh, but the British found that they had to re-intervene in Iraq, send troops back there, prop up this Hashemite kingdom, uh, and, and uh, uh, sort of reestablish themselves in an effort again to extradite themselves from Iraq after the uh, Second World War, the British, together with American support, created uh, an uh, alliance system in the Middle East called CENTO, or Central, uh, Central Treaty Organization. Iraq was to be the core of this alliance system. Note the similarity to NATO. There was also one in Southeast Europe or Southeast Asia, I'm sorry, called CETO, with the same purpose. Well, this alliance system collapsed in 1958 when the Hash young Hashemite king, Faisal, was assassinated, uh, along with his prime minister, his uncle, prime minister. Uh, and Iraq then underwent a series of military nationalist governments, none very stable, uh, Finally, by the late 1960s, the Pan-Arabist Ba'ath Party, or, or Renaissance Party, uh, established control in Iraq uh, with goals uh, not, not at all uh, uh, in those that the United States had envisioned for this region with goals that were decidedly hostile to the state of Israel, with goals that were threatening to American oil interests to the south uh, in the Arabic, uh, Arabian Peninsula. Uh, in 1979, uh, a new Ba'ath leader came to power in Iraq, uh, a, a party thug named Saddam Hussein. Interestingly, that same year, the American position in the Middle East collapsed. Up until 1979, the main bulwark of American power uh, in the area from uh, Israel, the eastern end of the Mediterranean, uh, to Pakistan and, and beyond uh, into Southeast Asia was Iran. At that time ruled by the Pahlavi dynasty, uh, um, Muhammad Risa Pahlavi, uh, a hereditary ruler. He took the ancient Persian title Shah. The Americans supported him because he was anti-communist, because he was not an Arab, as the people in Iran are not, and because he was willing to sell oil to Israel. But in 1979, as you all will remember, his government collapsed 
and a radical Islamic government took over, uh, arrested or, or incarcerated the American diplomatic corps there and some other Americans and made clear that the American presence in Iran uh, was for the time being gone. What are the Americans going to do? How are they going to restore their situation here in the Middle East? Again, we all know why the Middle East is important. Oil. We all want to be able to drive our RVs to Disneyland every summer. <laughs> and so, the next year, the Americans found an opportunity to restore their situation. The next year, this thug in Iraq, Saddam Hussein, made one of the first of his several miscalculations. He looked across the border in Iran, uh, and he noticed that this religious regime had yet to establish itself firmly. And he perceived an opportunity. Maybe I can attack those guys. Maybe I can get some more territory down at the uh, end of the Persian Gulf. Maybe I can increase my oil revenues. And when he launched this attack in the summer of 1980 against Iran, he found a supporter, the United States. Uh, and the United States began to pump weapons and money, either directly or through surrogates, into Iraq. Saddam Hussein became an American client. American officials, among them Don Rumsfeld, made themselves known in Baghdad. Uh, but this, this attack didn't work. Uh, Iran is 12th, 12th or twice as populous as Iraq. And very soon the Iraqi attack bogged down. And then by 1982, two years later, the Iraqis were back to their old border. A, a stalemate ensued. Uh, the conflict became just horrendous, a kind of World War I type scenario where both sides were in trenches, both sides used poison gas, uh, mass attacks consistently failed. Uh, by 1988, uh, both sides were exhausted. Over a million casualties had ensued, uh, and uh, the war uh, was brought to an end by an armistice. It still has not ended officially, by the way. Well, okay, 1988, Saddam Hussein's resources were depleted. He's got no money left. Uh, his, his manpower, his, his military has been eroded uh, by this pointless conflict. And he started to seek some means uh, to regain money. And when he regains money, when he regained money, he knew he could get more of other kinds of resources. And he looked around and he saw on his southern border what looked at like a very tempting target. The rich, weak emirate of Kuwait. Now, remember, Saddam Hussein still sees himself, still saw himself as an American client, and he had no reason to disbelieve this. The Americans had given him no indication that he was cut off. And why should they? They, he, they know, he knows that Americans still like him better than they like those guys in Iran. So he looked down at Kuwait and he thought, what if I just pluck this apple from the tree? What are the Americans going to do? They don't care. And he got no, he got no stuff. He made a couple of, of admittedly, inept approaches. Uh, and the, in the return, he got inept responses from the American diplomatic board. And so in the summer, August of 1990, his forces moved into Kuwait. Kuwait couldn't do anything and resist. The wealthy people got out, everybody else, everybody else stayed there and became uh, clients of, of Iraq. Well, it took a while for the Americans to decide what to do in this situation. Do we want to kick uh, Saddam out and thus weaken him and weaken our position against Iran? Or do we want to defend Kuwait? And, and the Kuwaitis launched a very effective uh, campaign. You may remember stories of infants in incubators being tossed out by the Iraqi soldiers. Never happened. You, know, you may remember uh, stories of other atrocities. And the American government decided they had to defend Kuwait. They assembled a coalition. Uh, it was ready to go by January 1991. 
uh, and uh, Operation Devil or Desert Storm quickly, uh, quickly kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. But then it stopped. The then Secretary of Defense, Richard Cheney, understood that, as he later said in 1994, Iraq was a quagmire. We'll get bogged down there. Americans and British uh, maintained a, a kind of monitoring of Iraq thereafter, uh, regular overflights uh, to ensure that uh, Saddam Hussein could not assemble any kind of meaningful ground or air forces and he couldn't be a threat again to Kuwait. And there the situation languished until uh, the advent to the presidency of the United States uh, by George Bush the Jr. The second. Now the story gets murky. There are indications that even before 9-11, the Bush government was considering an attack on Iraq. Why? Now that's even murkier. Perhaps to restore this position in the Middle East, the one lost back in 1979. Perhaps uh, to, uh, even, even more abstractly, to extend democracy, uh, to uh, have a bulwark against Iran. It's not clear. But after 9-11, there are increasing uh, indications from the Bush government that there was somehow a connection. And further, that, that somehow this regime in Baghdad, Saddam Hussein, their old pal, represented a, a threat in terms of weapons of mass destruction. Chemical, biological, nuclear. Hence the attack at the beginning of 2003. Now, as you all know, uh, Saddam Hussein's forces quickly collapsed, and, and this enabled uh, the Bush government uh, to engage in a kind of foolish triumphalism, mission accomplished, uh, but indeed, uh, by the summer of 2003, it was clear that there was a massive resistance to the American presence. Now, it's instructive that to this day, no face has been put on that resistance. Who's fighting against the Americans? What organization? Well, a variety of small organizations have been identified. The army of this cleric, or perhaps that terrorist. But that, that in itself uh, indicates that the Americans don't know who's fighting. And that indicates that they're fighting against everyone. And this is where we are today, ladies and gentlemen. Now there's a current strategy you're all hearing about. It's, it's being talk, talked about uh, in, the, in the halls of Congress this week. The surge. Uh, this is supposed to guarantee uh, that it was supposed to guarantee, uh, I, I take back, uh, that stable conditions would be established for a uh, Iraqi government to take control. This hasn't happened. And I would suggest to you all, and then I'm going to stop, that the real purpose of the surge is to hand over the Iraq problem to whoever succeeds George Bush uh, in a little over a year. So that he can escape the responsibility of having caused this problem and let somebody else figure out its conclusion. That's all I have. Before I introduce the next speaker, I, I want to recognize a few other people. Uh, to my left here, you can see her, because it's not that good light. Um, is Kathy Zach, who is. Uh, my assistant editor on the Journal of Third World Studies, and she's helped me now for uh, over 20 years. And uh, again, I appreciate it. I don't know how many times I've told her. 
Um, and next to her is her husband, Paul, who is uh, retired from the uh, Secret Service. He was with President, uh, President Carter uh, over here in Plains. Also, Bill Harris is over to my right. Uh, I think we all know Bill and Linda Lee Purvis there. I didn't see you all when I came in. And, and one of my colleagues, Amy Porter, and her husband, Nathan, next to her. And I, is, uh, is, is Hal Ali here? Uh, well, I just wanted to mention because uh, that was one of the reasons I was late. Um, was that uh, she helped me, she's a student in pre-med, uh, set up the room. We had to rearrange all the tables and the chairs and everything. Uh, and, uh, uh, but anyhow, I want to thank, I'll thank her now publicly because uh, I couldn't have gotten it done without her. Um, okay, and if I've forgotten anybody else, I'm sorry. I see Sam Peavy back there. I appreciate it. Sam. And, uh, I think I can recognize. I see some of my students. And, okay. That's good. <laughs> I still have it. They're still letting me teach a class. You see. So, yeah. um, our next speaker is, he's, he's new to Georgia Southwestern, uh, Dr. Brian G. Smith, a political scientist um, who received his BA degree from Oberlin College and MA and PhD in political science from Brown University. And uh, he has various fields, you can see that on the brochure, and, uh, but is involved very much in the international area. He served as a research assistant at President Carter Center in Atlanta and has had uh, several fellowships and so forth. We're glad that he's joined us and he's going to talk on results of political changes in Iraq since 2003. So please join me. Welcome. I fail to project my voice, please let me know. I'm not reaching the... Uh, the Why don't you call. use a microphone? Uh, well, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay, good. I've been asked to summarize all the political changes and their <laughs> impact upon the people of Iraq from 2003 to 2007 in 10 to 15 minutes. And honestly, I'd probably have an easier time summarizing 200 years of political change in America than these past four years in Iraq. <laughs> They passed a new constitution in 2005, and so I want to take that as a reasonable starting point, that the government of the United States handed off official power, at least domestically, in some areas, to the Iraqi people in this national government. And I want to read to you from the very beginning of this constitution, in fact, the preamble. It invokes the Koran, and then says, we, the sons of Mesopotamia, the land of the prophets, resting place of the holy imams, the leaders of civilization and the creators of the alphabet, the cradle of arithmetic, on our land, the first law put in place by mankind was written. In our nation, the most noble era of justice in the politics of nations was laid down. On our soil, the followers of the prophet and the saints prayed, the philosophers and the scientists theorized, and the writers and the poets created. Despite this effort, right from the very beginning of the constitution of Iraq, to portray their country as having some kind of unified identity, some kind of unifying social construct that could make it an independent nation and an independent people, Despite that effort, as Dr. Hall described, the history of Iraq is both relatively new in the sense that it only goes back 80 years as just simply an independent country of any kind whatsoever, but also 
filled with a great deal of history that includes a lot of conflicts between peoples inside the borders of Iraq. So there's no shared national identity at the national level. You see this right after World War I, when the British took three provinces of the Ottoman Empire and decided that that would be a nice little political unit. That would become the, this kingdom of Iraq they wanted to create, and people had a problem with that right from the beginning. In fact, it was as early as 1922 that the Kurds in the north declared an independent kingdom of Kurdistan, and the British army had to be sent in to put it down. And it took a couple years to do it, to haul them back into this thing they were creating called the Kingdom of Iraq, under the auspices of the League of Nations. So right from the beginning, there have been such conflicts. In fact, it goes back farther than that. The Kurds were rebelling against Ottoman uh, uh, rule even earlier than that. But nevertheless, what we've been left with is a country with enormous divisions inside of it that don't see themselves as a united people. Of course, I'm hopefully everyone here, I don't, uh, I don't think any of us have time to go too deeply into the divisions between Sunni Arabs, Shiite Arabs, and Sunni Kurds, but those are in fact the three major groupings inside of Iraq, and they all have a great deal of divisions inside of them as well. The Shiite uh, uh, Arabs are in no sense some kind of unified people who all seem to seemingly get along and want to live together peacefully uh, in one single nation. In order to sum up all the uh, political changes in this short amount of time, I want to focus on one aspect of the political changes, and that is where does real political power lie in Iraq? Not necessarily does a constitution contain certain liberties and guarantees, uh, they, it does, but where does actual power lie? Because the national government fails to have any kind of real legitimacy. One cannot simply point to this national government that was created and say, this government has the support of the, any real Iraqi people as some kind of government of all Iraqis. So the national government is not really not recognized as legitimate and lacks real power throughout the country. The central government can give an order and it's not followed elsewhere in the country. It doesn't even try to give many such orders. And in fact, the constitution supports, this new constitution of theirs supports the idea of very strong regionalism and local power. So I want to talk about those regional bases of power, those local power, because that's where power really lies in Iraq today, outside of uh, I'm leaving aside the issue of the power of the United States government and the United States military presence there. I'm speaking only of Iraqi power and its impact upon the Iraqi people, this change. Well, in most cases, you need two things to have real political power in Iraq today. You need to have, one, the right family name. You have to be a leader of the right family. Iraq politics going back hundreds of years is tribal or clan, depending on what part of the country you're talking about. Who your parents were, what, whether or not you were the descendant of a great leader of a particular people, absolutely critical to have power today. The second thing you need to have power today in Iraq is guns and people willing to shoot them for you. As, uh, to paraphrase Thomas Friedman, he said, Iraq is a democracy today, technically a procedure of democracy, but it looks a lot more like the Sopranos than it does the West Wing. It's feuding tribal groups who have this local regional power. And I want to give you some examples of that. Uh, those regional groups, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. I can't be exhaustive, particularly not in 10 to 15 minutes. There's simply too many, which is actually part of the problem. The power is so fractured in Iraq right now that you can even speak of a group of 20 people in a village somewhere who have formed their own particular special brand of militia, given themselves a name, and declared themselves ruler of this village. And they actually are obeyed in that village because people fear for their lives and others have to deal with them because maybe they're the ones that keep the water running in that bit of village. But in any case, I want to give you some examples of these groups with political power in this country. Two of the major Shiite political parties in Iraq, 
are noteworthy. There are a couple others that are probably noteworthy as well, but I want to focus on two. One is the largest Shiite political party in the country. It dominates the parliament. It has 113 seats out of 275 total. And this in a system that requires two-thirds of the parliament to, get, to agree to get much done. In any case, this political party has the name Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq. At least it did up until about May of this year when it decided that was too inflammatory of a name despite the fact that it had called itself that since 1982. And they changed their name to the Supreme Islamic Iraqi Council. They dropped the whole revolutionary part because they decided they'd won and no longer needed said revolution anymore. Skiri, as it's uh, generally known, uh, the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution in Iraq, uh, got started as a revolutionary militia operating out of Iran in 1982 to overthrow the Iraqi regime and install an Islamic government in Iraq. They are, have a power base located mostly in southern Iraq and actually down there in southern Iraq amongst the Shiites living down there who have a lot of close ties to the Shiites living in Iran. If any of you know anything about Hezbollah in Lebanon the function fulfilled by the Supreme Council in southern Iraq is very similar to that of Hezbollah in Lebanon. They had the same similar ties uh, to Iran, this is kind of support for uh, their movement inside of their country. And they provide health services, social services. They keep the water running and flowing. They keep clinics working. They get things done as a government, practically, in southern Iraq. This has endeared them to the people of southern Iraq. It creates a power base for them, and that is, in fact, where most of their popular support comes from. On top of that, kind of like the uh, relationship of Sinn Féin to the IRA in Ireland, the Supreme Council also has a military wing. They got the guns and the people to use them as well. Uh, it's called the Badr Brigade, if you've ever heard of it, the Badr Militia. You may have noticed from time to time that the Badr Militia was fighting with some other uh, uh, organization over there. You might have heard the Badr Brigade was actually attacking British soldiers, or you might have heard the Badr Brigade was uh, blamed, at least, for the uh, slaughter of many Sunnis in a region, ethnic cleansing in an area, or even attacks on United States soldiers. Well, they are, in fact, simply the armed militia supporting, directly supporting, the Supreme Council. They are the same group. They are the same organization. The largest political party in the Iraqi national government is also this militia that uh, is fighting in the streets. And who leads it? Uh, a man named Abdul al-Hakim. And he took over from his father. And it looks like he is going to be passing, unfortunately, onto, uh, or fortunately, if you dislike the man, uh, on to his son reasonably, recent, reasonably soon. He has lung cancer, apparently. But it is a family matter. The Al-Hakims started the party back in 1982. They gained the support of their Shiite followers in Iraq and all the struggle over the years against Saddam Hussein and uh, uh, the uh, Ba'athists and the Sunnis in general. And now it stays a family thing. Unfortunately, that family, which is known as sort of an aristocratic Shiite family with deep clerical ties, deep religious uh, ties, has a rival, another Shiite political party that's controlled, is actually a voting bloc controlled by Muqtada al-Sadr. They have about 30 seats in parliament, in the parliament. They also have a militia. You may have heard of it. It's called the Mahdi Army. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Is anybody pronouncing it? Mahdi? Excuse me. The Mahdi Army. They openly fought street battles with the United States. They have openly fought street battles with Sunnis, cleansing various areas of Baghdad. They've openly fought street battles with the Badr Brigade, and they are simply part of a voting bloc inside of Parliament. They are a political party. And they are led by, well, another family, a rival family, in fact, to the Al-Hakim Shiite family. 
The Al Hakim Shiite family has had these ri uh, rivals, the Sadr family, for quite some time. In fact, the power base, like the uh, Supreme Council has its power base in southern Iraq, the Sadr uh, uh, militia, the Mahdi army, has a power base in what is known as Sadr City, which is actually just a large slum in Baghdad, slum area in Baghdad, and it's named after Muqtada al Sadr's father, a famous cleric who uh, was uh, killed, unfortunately. And these two families have literally been feuding for generations. It is very much like the Sopranos. <laughs> They dislike each other, not just for current political reasons, but family feuding that has been back generations in a struggle for control. And they're most of uh, Sadr's supporters tend to be from the poor, as opposed to uh, al Qaeda's sort of middle-class Shiite uh, uh, supporters. Well, in addition to these Shiite militias and these two major political parties that control the Iraqi national government, there are a number of other Shiite groups, but I want to move on to the Sunni Arabs. I want to say just briefly about the Sunni Arabs. Most of them have fractured into very sm relatively small militias, very small groups, little local power bases that uh, have grown out of the various Ba'athist supporters and army supporters of uh, Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein favored various tribes within the Sunni population while he was uh, in power, and their supporters sort of rolled over into opposing American occupation and have set up power in various local parts of Iraq. Well, one of the major areas for the Sunnis is north central Iraq and the western uh, part of Iraq that you may have heard about in the news just recently about Anbar province uh, is dominated by various Sunni tribes. There are in fact 31 separate major Sunni tribes in Iraq that consider themselves separate from each other. They're willing to make alliances with each other as necessary. In fact, they recently did as early as March of last year. They made some alliances with each other to fight some other local Sunni militias as well as some foreign fighters that had come into the area in order, because, why? Because those foreign fighters had killed off some of the leaders of their families, and that ticked them off. And so they organized together, but nevertheless, they don't consider themselves one political entity. They consider themselves equal, and it is they not the national government, not any kind of regional government that controls power in western Iraq and in north central Iraq. They control local government. That is where real power lies, is within these Sunni tribes. In the north, you have a totally separate situation. You have the Sunni Kurds who have finally taken all but probably the last step for the independence they've been seeking for hundreds of years if at the very uh, at, you know, at least probably, but one could definitely say for at least 85 years ever since they declared that independent kingdom of Kurdistan I mentioned earlier after the British took over. Well, uh, this, the Kurds continued to fight for independence the entire history of the 20th century. They never stopped. It didn't matter whether it was Saddam Hussein uh, running the country, it didn't matter if it was a military general, it didn't matter if it was the king under the British created monarchy, they wanted independence. They didn't consider themselves a part of this country. They felt robbed by history. They were cheated by history out of their own independent country. And they had been fighting using revolutionary uh, tactics of literally terrorism against the Iraqi regime or allies of the Iraqi regime. They had fought open civil wars. The rather famous uh, incident where Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons on a village of Kurds, killing quite a few Kurds. Well, that was actually during a civil war where the Kurds were actively supporting the Iranians to fight against the central government. It's what they'd always been doing. Well, after the Gulf War, things changed. In 1992, they declared practical autonomy. One step short of actually declaring independence. Saddam Hussein lost all, kind, all control over northern Iraq. Kurdistan was created. They created a national assembly, a part of government to run Kurdistan, and were essentially operating as an independent country already. 
long before the United States actually invaded. Well, it wasn't exactly peaceful. The power in Kurdistan is divided between two rival clans, two families who had quite a few uh, people willing to use guns. They, uh, they were called the Peshmerga, uh, literally those willing to die, uh, who had been fighting for independence against the Iraqi government for uh, decades. And the power was divided between these two rival clans, and it immediately spilled over to real violence and civil war between them in 1993 to 1995. So literally, they declare independence, and then they start fighting amongst themselves. And it's not just minor clashes. Estimates are about 10,000 people died in these clashes between the two Kurdish clans. Their rivals, these two, went back many generations. The two clans are the Barzani clan, the Barzani clan, and the Talibani uh, clan. The Barzani clan run Kurdistan. The president of uh, Kurdistan is the son of the person who founded, founded right after World War II, something called the Kurdistan Democratic Party, which also had a military wing and was dedicated to overthrowing Iraqi rule of Kurdistan and using any means necessary to do so. Well, the son of the guy who founded that is the current president of Kurdistan, a symbolic position, just like it is for uh, the Iraqi government. Just to give you an idea of how much it's all a family matter, the uh, nephew of that president is the prime minister. The son of the president is the head of the intelligence service, essentially a secret, very powerful secret police, an internal police for the region. And there are more family members scattered throughout the entire government. It is a family thing. In fact, the two clan, that one, the Barzani clan, dominate two of the three provinces of Kurdistan. The third province is the home of the Talibani clan. They currently have, uh, you may recognize the name from simply the current president of Iraq, President Talibani. He took over the ceremonial uh, head of state function uh, for Iraq, uh, but he also heads up this patriotic union of Kurdistan, which is all the second uh, uh, most powerful political party in the Kurdistan government. And they dislike each other. It's a feud going back very long ways. It's unclear where power is going to end up lying in Kurdistan, but it is definitely going to split along those two lines, and they're both armed. They probably have the best fighting force outside of the United States in all of Iraq. It's now estimated that the Peshmerga, which are attempting to uh, unite uh, the two clans' fighters together into one force, make up probably about 200,000 uh, total fighting soldiers, and I have gone terribly over my time, so I want to uh, uh, finish up by just pointing out that the main, that main question of whether or not politically the people are better off in Iraq than under Saddam Hussein, I would have to ask you which people. If you were talking about the dead people, the people who have died in the past four years, I would have to say on their part, no. <coughs> But there are plenty of people who are still alive yeah, throughout Iraq. And again, I'd have to ask you, which ones? The Kurds, they have probably taken one more step towards independence and are absolutely thrilled and have benefited dramatically from uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, removal politically. The Shiites, well, again, it depends on which ones. Certainly, a couple of the main militias that dominate the current parliament have benefited dramatically politically. They've always had very close ties to Iran, very close friends with uh, Iran, and they're now finally able to establish a Shiite-dominated system inside of Iraq, for at the very least, the regions they control. The Sunni tribes, well, at least they don't have to worry about buying off Saddam constantly. They don't have to worry about his interference anymore in their tribal matters. They can get back to doing what they'd always been doing for hundreds of years, and most of the part time Saddam left them alone anyway. So who, benefited, who didn't benefit politically? Well, quite possibly the rest of the country <laughs> that actually isn't invested in one of those particular groups where power actually now lies rather than this central government uh, that's talked about all the time uh, on the news. And with that, I apologize for running oh. over. <laughs> Thank you.
I was going to introduce uh, also, oh, there he is, uh, Glenn Robbins, who uh, was chair of our department, but now now he, he's associate professor of history sitting back there and has a, a very important program, the POW program and oral history and so forth. Don't, don't you have a program coming up? Uh, Wednesday night at 7 at the Island and Friday at 11 here. Uh, Wednesday at 7 and next Wednesday, 7 at the Rylander and what? And uh, Friday at 11 here in the Student Success Center. Right, this Friday? Uh, next? Yeah, a week from Friday. Oh, week from Friday at, uh, at 11 yeah. in the Student Success Center. Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, our next speaker is no stranger to the seminar series, uh, Phil Smedra is an economist here, agricultural economist. He went to Penn State, undergraduate, but then found the right way and came to the University of Georgia to get his master's and uh, PhD in agricultural economics. He, he worked for the Department of Agriculture. He served in the Peace Corps. Uh, he's, uh, his favorite project is Fiji. Yeah, it's not a bad place to go to. And in fact, he has an article coming out in the Journal of Third World <coughs> Studies um, on, on, on that and health issues, lifestyle diseases, and so forth. And Phil is going to enlighten us about the impact of economic development. Um, thanks, Harry. Um, good. So we've got all screens going here. My charge is to talk about the economic uh, situation, and forgive my voice, it actually has deteriorated over the past 30 minutes. Um, the economic situation in Iraq, post-American uh, uh, involvement. And there's, there's good news and there's bad news. Uh, the good news is that the Iraqi economy is doing very well. It's strangely enough, in spite of uh, the media uh, coverage that we have of uh, the hostilities that are going on there, the economy is pumping along very well. Uh, the bad news is that the principal reason why it's moving along very well is because of consumption spending. And if you know anything about economics and economic development, what a country needs is more than simply consumption spending, it needs investment. And in a country like Iraq, in a developing country, what is required is what's called FDI, foreign direct investment. And that's uh, not forthcoming because of the uh, security situation. So consumers in Iraq are spending. They're spending a great deal. Uh, the economy is estimated to increase last year in 2006 by 17 percent, uh, which is huge. It's much, uh, much quicker pace than the Chinese economy. Um, that's one estimate. Uh, the World Bank estimates uh, about 6 percent. So there's a big uh, difference in estimation. And one would expect there would be a big difference in uh, GDP estimation, gross domestic product estimation, because it's very difficult to uh, be on the ground there and collect data. So uh, good news and bad news. Um, as you probably realize that uh, the um, Iraqi economy has been and continues to be dominated by the petroleum sector, 95% uh, of foreign exchange earnings. Uh, as Dr. Hall mentioned, uh, there was a great deal of destruction during the, uh, the 1980s, the Iran-Iraq War, and a great deal of destruction in particular to the petroleum infrastructure in Iraq, uh, which caused a significant decrease in uh, revenues and the ability of that country to grow. All these pictures are, are of um, Baghdad, except for the last one, of course, which was out in the Persian Gulf. Um, all the major industries in Iraq connected to the oil industry, the petroleum industry, and petroleum uh, byproducts like fertilizers, chemicals, uh, and as this says, petroleum refining. Um, Diversification prior to the American invasion was pretty much limited because the state was involved in the overall economy to a great deal. Um, and there wasn't a great deal of privatization. And as some of you know, especially some of you who uh, have been or 
uh, are currently my students. Um, Privatization, uh, that is moving the state out of uh, uh, the economy, is the principal way that uh, economies grow. States are um, governments that uh, control economies are uh, typically um, lethargic in, in growth. And uh, by privatiza privatization, the privatization process causes growth. And also because Iraq was under international sanctions that were imposed by the United Nations beginning in 1991 up through the American invasion. That also uh, hindered the ability of uh, the economy to grow or any kind of manufacturing base to develop. Just a couple of things about Iraqi oil. Iraq sits on the third largest proven reserve pool of oil. Uh, the first is Saudi Arabia, the second is Iran, and then Iraq. Uh, proven reserves. Um, but only about 10% of um, Iraqi territory has been um, uh, prospected. 90% remains kind of unknown. And some geologists uh, predict that probably up to 100 billion more barrels of oil lay on uh, the sands essentially in west, uh, the western part of Iraq. And also, um, Iraq contains about 100 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. To compare that to uh, American proven reserves of natural gas. In the United States, proven reserves are about 160 trillion cubic feet. So Iraq has about, you know, give or take, about two-thirds of what the United States total proven reserves of, of um, natural gas are. And this last point, I think, is an interesting one, and one that I didn't know about. Iraq has about 2,000 drilled wells compared to one million in Texas. And so the potential for this country to provide uh, the world, the global market with petroleum are enormous, is enormous. Uh, the country obviously could be energy dependent, but under the Ba'athist regime, under the uh, regime of Saddam Hussein, uh, much of the petroleum infrastructure was allowed to deteriorate. Um, and currently, uh, uh, since 2003, the um, the problems of uh, violence and sabotage and terrorist activity has uh, caused a great deal of damage to the petroleum infrastructure. Unemployment, between 30 and 60 percent of uh, potential uh, labor force is without work, which is not a surprising figure if you know anything about the developing world. That's probably pretty um, normal uh, if we look at uh, even many countries in that region. Uh, formal employment is uh, pretty much limited to, as this says, uh, civil service, the government, the military, um, a bit of the oil industry. Uh, well, the oil industry employs a bit of the labor force. But most people rely on one individual to provide uh, income for essentially their entire extended families. Uh, and that's the case in Iraq. Um, I didn't find a good legitimate picture to uh, put in here f as far as uh, imports go. So these, these women are importing uh, from one place to another. Um, uh, fuel wood, which many people in rural areas and, and also many people in urban areas use in order to cook. And that's unfortunately what these, these females are doing and probably they go out uh, judging on the size of their loads here, maybe once every two days. Uh, to collect fuel wood. Um, the, the embargo, the trade embargo that the United Nations put in place in, two, in 1991, again, which lasted for 12 years, restricted Iraq to the exportation of simply petroleum. And therefore, uh, any kind of manufacturing base was stunted. Any kind of growth in their manufacturing base was stunted because there were no export markets. And so, um, Iraq imports a uh, great deal of the uh, goods and, uh, that it, it uses. Food, fuel, strangely enough, although it's sitting on the third biggest known res reserves of petroleum, medicines, manufactured goods. In spite of all that's gone on since 2003, the economy is booming, as I said. Um, mobile phone use is up uh, by five times over simply the past two years. Uh, construction, wholesale trade sectors, everybody's doing well. 34,000 registered companies as opposed to uh, 8,000 in 2004. So there's a dynamic um, aspect of the Iraqi economy. 
I mentioned this figure right at the beginning of my little talk here. Um, some estimates of the uh, Iraqi economy, and again, it's very difficult to estimate uh, gross domestic product for a country that's involved in this, this civil war. Uh, but some people, some analysts, uh, estimate uh, growth last year at 17%. Again, I said the World Bank. And a more conservative estimate says 6%. But still, 6% uh, growth, growth in the United States last year in 2006 was about 2.8%, between 2.8 and 3%. That's the estimation. And so Iraq is going to, growing, if we use just the conservative World Bank estimate, at twice the rate that the United States is. <clears throat> if, in fact, security improves, and one would hope that it will, who knows when, but uh, probably that's going to happen when um, the American military leaves. Uh, security will eventually improve when the Civil War has uh, run its course. Uh, when that occurs, then you'll see a great deal of foreign direct investment, FDI. And this is the way that developing economies grow, uh, through companies deciding that they want to, in fact, invest in Iraq. Iraq needs infrastructure. It needs hospitals, highways, uh, power generating plants, and much of the money that's coming in now, there is some FDI coming in, foreign direct investment, but much of it goes to, uh, to security concerns. Uh, hiring um, uh, your own small little uh, uh, expatriate militias in order to protect uh, diplomats and, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, this kind of investment does absolutely nothing to ensure future uh, Iraqi growth. But in spite of um, much of the foreign direct investment going towards security concerns, there is a trickle-down effect. And the economic situation is a vibrant one um, that, as this says, is, is kind of invisible when you see uh, news coverage of what's going on in Iraq. Uh, there's plenty of cash to go around. Well, why is that? Well, because the Iraqis essentially didn't have any, anything to spend that money that they were earning back between 1991 and 2003 because of the embargo, the trade embargo of imports into Iraq. So um, there's a great deal of cash in the Iraqi economy. Uh, there's a great deal of spending, but again, it's consumer spending. And an economy, in order for it to grow, needs um, producers. It needs industry to do spending on um, investment type goods, building factories and building infrastructure. That's the kind of investment that's required. <coughs> Salaries have increased by 100% since the fall of Saddam Hussein. Tax, taxes, income taxes, have decreased from 45% to 15%. And so there's a great deal of disposable income. The Iraqis have money. And one indication of that is what's happened to real estate prices in Iraq. And according to my little slide here, they've increased depending on what region of the country uh, you visit, and particularly in the north, that has been very um, calm relative to other parts of the country. Uh, real estate prices have gone up by several hundred percent. So even though we have this picture of Iraq as a country essentially falling apart, and in fact it probably will, um, the Iraqis have a great deal of confidence in the future of Iraq because they're buying property, they're buying houses, they're buying land, and the prices of those things are increasing. So what really uh, needs to happen is obviously uh, the security situation needs to improve. Uh, it needs, uh, the, uh, the country needs a functional financial system. It needs a banking system. It needs financial markets. The Iraqi Stock Exchange, uh, which used to be called the Baghdad Stock Exchange, the Iraqi Stock Exchange now uh, has been in operation since 2005. And they have a daily um, value of shares traded of about $2 million, uh, which is tiny. But at least it's the seed of something that uh, possibly will help that, eco that economy grow. Talk to Iraqis in, in business, in finance, uh, they realize that in order for uh, this country to grow, we need, they need a banking system and they need financial markets. This last point here, um, <coughs> bond market buyers, and there are bond markets there, have been willing to invest in short-term uh, sovereign debt. That is, the government of Iraq is issuing bonds 
And there are buyers for those bonds, but the longest term that they're willing to risk their money for is six months. In the United States, um, we sell bonds, we sell our own debt up to 30 years into the future, and everybody perceives those bonds to be a good investment. Folks in Iraq and in the region that are involved in the bond markets are willing only to buy six month uh, Iraqi debt. So, um, You've got a business climate that is very inhospitable. You've got uh, sectarian violence that occurs on a daily basis, as we all know. Um, but companies, uh, especially companies that are selling direct to consumers, are thriving. Uh, as soon as the United States pulls out, or pulls a majority of its troops out, the amount of money coming into that country is going to decrease. But the economy seems to be vibrant enough that it will uh, make up that loss in dollars coming in and develop its own uh, dynamism. And that's essentially all I have. Thanks very much. Thank you. Let me just uh, black this out. Next speaker is Dr. Brian Parkinson is a member of the history department. He, he got his BA in history from Georgia Southern and MA and PhD in Middle Eastern history from Florida State. He taught at Florida State in Tallahassee and London. He teaches a lot of third world classes and um, he's published, he's got an article coming out on um, um, Israel and, and uh, in Lebanon in the early 80s and um, in the Journal of Third World Studies also. And he was a member of the Fulbright Hayes Seminar on, on current uh, climate in South Africa. He's going to talk about religious and social conditions, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, I just wanted to mention that Tony Snow called me today and said, you know, he doesn't like or approve of the word civil war or occupation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. So uh, let's let's think about the three major groups that we have in Iraq. You got the uh, the Sunni Kurds in the north, and you have the uh, Sunni Arabs in the west, and the Shia. Arabs in the south and the east. Uh, these lines were broken down along the borders of the Ottoman Empire to the west and north and the Persian Empire to the east and Baghdad pretty much got caught in between. It was shifting over the centuries kind of like Alsace Lorraine between back and forth between France and Germany back and forth between uh, Shiite Persia, Persia and Sunni uh, Ottoman Empire for hundreds of years and so Baghdad ends up as this kind of uh, cosmopolitan city where you have uh, Shia, Sunni and also Christians and Jews and Kurds living there so but over time this has changed so um, let's talk about how everything has changed since the war has happened what are some of the good things that have happened first well, if you haven't noticed by now, things are doing pretty well in Kurdistan. But they were doing pretty well in Kurdistan before the war started. If you consider the fact that uh, Clinton and, was it NATO or the UN that had imposed a no-fly zone over the north, so there was very little interference from Baghdad or Hussein in Kurdistan to begin with, well, Kurdistan has quite uh, much flourished since then. As a matter of fact, they're actually uh, creating a brand new university in uh, Suleymaniyya. It's uh, actually called the American University of Iraq. I mean, the, the idea of uh, opening a brand new university in Baghdad, could you imagine that? Yeah, the American University of Baghdad. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that would go over really well. Uh, secondly, you have a, uh, uh, in Kurdistan, the economy is uh, doing pretty well. You do actually have foreign investment in Kurdistan, but not in the rest of Iraq. People are unwilling to uh, invest money in the rest of Iraq. 
uh, because they're concerned about s uh, civil war. Another good thing is that you do now have majority rule under Saddam Hussein. You had a minority, about 20% Sunni Arabs controlling a majority of Shia, who are about two thirds, and then another 20% Kurds. And so now you have a majority rule. Um, although I think Montesquieu would uh, disagree that uh, this is uh, a good thing. Montesquieu said, you know, that you have to uh, argue. You have to figure out what is the right political uh, or form of uh, politics and governance for each individual people at each individual time and each individual place. So, you know, what might work for America right now might not necessarily work for Iraq right now. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, in, uh, the environment has actually in improved a little bit. Uh, since Saddam. You have the uh, marsh Arabs returning to the marsh. You have the marsh is now reflooded. Uh, Saddam Hussein didn't exactly like the marsh Arabs and so he uh, drained the swamps and so they've now refilled them and uh, wildlife is coming back to the Tigris and Euphrates and so these are some really good things that have taken place uh, since the invasion. All right so now let's talk about uh, I guess the bad. I won't get into the ugly. Um, so what are some of the bad things? Uh, well, Iraqis are actually dying at a four times faster rate from violence now than under Saddam Hussein. Four times faster, faster, okay? Beyond that, you have a serious refugee problem. There are over two million refugees who have left Iraq in the past few years. Where have they gone? Mostly to uh, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon and to a lesser degree Egypt and Europe. The United States of these two million refugees uh, in a war that we essentially caused or created this situation where you have this crisis, refugee crisis, of these two million refugees we've uh, accepted less than a couple hundred into the United States. Chile has accepted more refugees than the United States. So has New Zealand, so has Sweden, okay? There's more people in Georgia than Sweden, okay? So, <laughs> all right. Um, beyond that, uh, uh, these refugees that are leaving, most of the refugees are Christians. Saddam Hussein had protected Christians. As a matter of fact, some of his most highly ranking uh, ministers were Christians, like uh, Tariq Aziz, for, existent, for example. Most of these uh, Christian refugees are going up into Europe. Uh, America doesn't want them. We don't trust them. Um, a lot of the refugees that are going into, most of, the refugees, most of the refugees that are leaving Iraq are women. The men are dead. And so it's women with their children. And you'll often see in places like Damascus and Beirut and Amman, you'll see mothers prostituting their underage daughters for food. For food. It's a similar situation to what was happening to German women after World War II and Japanese women after World War II. And so uh, that's something that has certainly uh, been very bad since uh, the fall of Saddam Hussein. Beyond that, we have a significant amount of ethnic cleansing, particularly in Baghdad, because that was the uh, cosmopolitan capital. That's where you had... Uh, Christians, Jews, Kurds, Shia Arabs, Sunni Arabs all living together. And if you looked at a ba map of Baghdad prior to the fall of Saddam Hussein, you would see that east of the river there was uh, mostly Shiites, but these were all mixed neighborhoods with Shiites predominating. And west of the river you would see mostly Sunni areas, but they were always mixed. <laughs> Since the fall of Saddam Hussein, the East is entirely Shiite and the West is becoming less and less Sunni. The Sunnis are uh, being enclaved. They are being pushed into smaller and smaller sections of the town. They're essentially being forced more and more out of Baghdad. So Baghdad is becoming more and more Shiite. All right. The Kurds, they've left Baghdad. They've gone uh, up to the north. Uh, we also have uh, an increased presence of, uh, well, 
Iranian infiltration into Iraq since the uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, since the fall of Saddam Hussein. Obviously, Saddam Hussein and Iran, they didn't get along too well. As Dr. Hall mentioned, they fought a war in which they killed about a million of each other. Well, since then, a lot of the uh, leading Shiite Arabs have come back from Iran where they uh, had received uh, sanctuary under Saddam Hussein, and now they're leading the government. So there is a very strong or close connection now between Tehran and Baghdad. If anyone has profited more from this war than anyone, it's Iran. Okay? And to a lesser degree, you have a, a lot of Shiite, excuse me, Syrian presence now in uh, Iraq. The, uh, the ruling Assad family in Damascus is a Shiite heterodoxy. They are a Shiite heresy, Alawites. They are Alawites, okay? Shiites would say, you're not Shiites, and they would say, yes, we are. Okay. Um, you can't tell me what I am. All right. They're not Shiites, but they say they are. All right, uh, so what you've seen since uh, the United States went into the Iraq is a uh, overarching Shiite crescent going from the Persian Gulf through Iraq, through Syria, and through Lebanon. You're seeing, uh, uh, I guess, a, uh, the, the, the growth of uh, Shia Islam, all right? <coughs> education, education is down. People aren't going to school. People aren't going to college anymore. Education is down tremendously. And finally, uh, we have uh, a civil war. Sorry, Tony Snow. Uh, we do have a civil war. And this civil war is very much, uh, for me, reminiscent of the civil war in Lebanon, where you have all these different kinds of religions and uh, ethnicities fighting against each other. And you have, it's like a house of mirrors. You have shifting uh, alliances depending on which way the wind is blowing. And so it's very hard to tell uh, who's on whose side from one day to the next. Okay? And I'll, I'll just end by, uh, by telling you that ooh, sorry, um, uh, the reason why the Shiites are so uh, concerned about asserting their dominance is that they were a besieged community under the Ottomans and under Saddam Hussein. They were a uh, majority in Iraq, but they were never treated like a majority. And so now is their chance to be treated like a majority. They were a uh, besieged and persecuted uh, community. And you could say the same thing about the Kurds. Uh, the, the concern about the Kurds in the north is that the Kurds and Kurdistan actually transcends multiple international boundaries. And so you have Iran and Turkey who are very concerned about possible Kurdish independence. And Turks, Turkey would uh, probably invade northern Iraq should the, Turk, excuse me, should the Kurds go fully independent. Maybe Iran as well. These are two communities that have uh, tried to maintain their particularity over time. They've done this, they've maintained their separateness through uh, two ways. For the, the Shiite Arabs, they maintained their, uh, their differentness from the Sunni Arabs by or through uh, religion, by keeping a separate religion. And for the Kurds, they've maintained their particularity by or through a different ethnicity. They are different. They're not Arabs. They're actually closer to Persians or Indo-Europeans. Kurdish is an Indo-European language. They speak their own language. They have their own customs, and they have their own culture. And so they've maintained this uh, separation from the dominant Sunni Arab majority in the Middle East through uh, these uh, particularities. And uh, lastly, I'll, I'll say that um, these Kurds and Shia have uh, insisted on endogamy. All right? They've maintained uh, group cohesion, group unity uh, in the face of uh, Sunni Arab uh, persecution over the centuries through endogamy. That means they do not marry outside of uh, their group. Okay? All right?
Our respondent is Dr. Miles Cooper, who received his undergraduate degree. I don't have that down here, but I'll mention it. From Auburn University. <laughs> An MA and PhD uh, from the University of Florida. He served with the Gainesville Police Department for 20 years and worked on his PhD uh, at the same time. And he, he's taught it. Uh, at uh, Auburn, I mean at Florida and Valdosta, and he's presently writing a textbook uh, on political science so, survey. So, Dr. Cooper is going to be our respondent. So. so, here this information we received, I would like to make a few comments and then ask a few questions if the audience doesn't have any. My comments come in the form of looking at this question from political science. The reason I'm doing this is so you can structure your thoughts on the question that Dr. Isaacs has posed, which is, are the Iraqi people better off today than they were under Saddam Hussein? So we're addressing a little bit, the purpose of political science is to look at how decisions are made. But a subfield of political science is to look at whether policies work or not. Are they effective? So aggressing further, public policies are designed to solve problems. And the problem here was terrorism. Did Iraq sponsor terrorism? If they were a threat, we want to reduce terrorism so we get rid of Saddam and change the regime in Iraq. So we want to democratize it. What we want to know now is what methods can we use to, under, to uncover whether the people are better off now than they were then. And you've heard their research methods has lots of ways to try to get at this. Essentially, what we can do is measure problems across time. And there are numerous indicators to measure problems and conditions across time. And the time that we would look at would be 2003, because that's when we entered Iraq. So we can look at the scope of problems before then, the scope of problems after then. Now, you've heard some people, some of the presenters here, use some of those indicators. Political science and economics are a little more open to quantifying using empirical indicators to measure problems across time. But history can do so also. So based on those ideas, thinking about indicators, the scope of problems before 2003 and after 2003, I'm wondering if any of you could expound on some of these indicators. You've already mentioned some of them. I've got a brief list of them here. For economics, it's income, poverty, GNP, unemployment, oil exports, social problems. Dr. Parkinson mentioned refugees, education, spending, literacy, inequality, health, diseases, mortality, certainly gone up, right? Um, then some political indicators, the idea of legitimacy, very abstract idea about whether people accept government, whether they're supporting themselves. The amount of political rights, freedom, violence, the degree of factionalism in a society and threats by countries, uh, adjacent countries. So if any of you want to pick up on those, thinking about those measures across time, because ultimately we want to know are they better off or not. Now we can measure those empirically, but certain people are going to have their subjective view about which of those problems are more severe than others. So if any of you want to pick up on that, I have some more specific questions. Yeah, we well, can just ask, uh, has terrorism stopped? since we invaded? Have there been any terrorist attacks in Europe, for example, since 2003? Quite a few, right? London, <coughs> Germany. Germany, and well, certainly aborted attacks as well. I mean, that, that's the ultimate goal of policy, is to prevent terrorism in other countries. But here, the, the question posed by Dr. Isaacs, are people better off mm -hmm. uh, I, now or, or before? So we want to know how they are acting. That's, that's oh, the intermediate goal, is is democratization occurring, which we hope lessens the threat of terrorism. But I would argue that it would be difficult to measure any of those things you're saying that we need to measure right now for Iraq in terms of all the indicators about whether or not life is better or not. I would question any data that I saw <coughs> about whether or not it was gathered accurately or not, or accurately enough that we could actually 
face some broad judgment that it was all worth it for the Iraqi people in some kind of broad sense, which I assume is the basis of the question. I mean, even basic economic indicators, you know, I would I would immediately have a question when you know, I'm told that six, the economy is growing by 6%, according to who? And how did they measure that? Uh, what what uh, economic activity was recorded properly and uh, that information was passed on in a fashion that no one uh, entered their own biased opinions or manipulated it? And what was the actual data used to collect that? And, uh, you know, cell phone use. You know, five times increased cell phone use Oh, you know, cell phones become more prevalent, and I'd also want to know, you know, how many were used to set off bombs yeah. uh, versus anything else. So, really, access to proper information in this case, in terms of measuring those uh, indicators, I think would be very, very hard to do, which tells you a little bit about the situation there, too, because you can't even count the number of dead bodies accurately right now. Literally, they don't properly record how many people have died at morgues inside of Iraq. They don't know how many people have died. Current economic, uh, the, what was praised just a, uh, two days ago as the best economic, uh, best, uh, excuse me, not economic, uh, best indicators of sectarian violence, that's uh, uh, from sectarian violence, and uh, we were given very, uh, uh, we were given data from the General Accounting Office of the United States as well as the Pentagon, and. Uh, uh, in a report to Congress, and if you dug into those numbers, you would see that they counted now, they changed the definition of sectarian violence so that if the person was shot in the front of the head, it was no longer counted as a sectarian killing, whereas it only if they were shot in the back of the head was it a sectarian killing. So I really question uh, and not whether or not we should be looking at those kind of indicators, like you're suggesting, to, uh, to tell us whether or not people are better off but literally, as outside observers from all the way over here in the United States, I couldn't tell you the accuracy of any information we got concerning any of those indicators. I think we can look at the migration. Look, people don't migrate in millions if things are going well, right? So, you know, uh, there's obviously a push factor and a pull factor in immigration, right? Often having to do with the economy, uh, violence, People don't leave if there are good jobs and low violence. What about, we're talking about um, the number of people getting killed. Mm. I know it's hard to get very accurate numbers, but do we have any idea on the number, the, the amount of people died due to political violence during the Saddam regime? Oh, there's a lot. I mean, is it, is, is it a lot more now or a lot more then? I mean, if it's a lot. Uh, it depends on what Tens of decide. thousands of people yeah. are dying after yeah. 2003, and tens of thousands of people are dying before 2003, yeah. and it happens to be a civil war after 2003, and Saddam's henchmen before 2003. Oh, absolutely. Is it, is it yeah. any better? It's, it's really, again, difficult to get those numbers because we have an authoritarian regime that didn't exactly properly record and advertise every time it murdered some opponent of the regime. Um, so, it, again, that kind of comparison game gets into a question of, well, if we have a genocide going on that where 300,000 people have been killed, is that really as bad as a genocide where 400,000 people have been killed? Um, you know, we will, inter we will intervene if it cracks 350. Uh, is, you know, not the kind of morality or ethical game that uh, I think is very productive. But um, in terms of how many were killed under the early regime, plenty. Uh, any that threatened the regime, there were plenty of civil wars from the Kurds against the regime. Heck, I mentioned uh, the Al-Hakim family. They seemed very unlikely to make any kind of political compromises with any of the Sunnis that are seen still as Ba'athist supporters under the previous regime, given the fact that, that Al-Hakim, uh, uh, Abdul Al-Hakim, who is the current leader of the Supreme Council, uh, he had eight brothers. Seven of them were murdered by Saddam Hussein. They were all revolutionaries fighting as Skiri. The eighth brother uh, had been the leader of the Supreme Council, but he was murdered by the Sunnis in late 2003 after the invasion. And so he's, the, he's now the guy in charge. Uh, so, What about some more qualitative measures, like the type of system that existed before 2003 and the type of mm. political system that exists now? So we're comparing an authoritarian system to the kind of system you described, right. which are pockets of power there. So. Again, it's just a way for you yeah, to again, think I would, about yeah. some of these 
measures or indicators, social indicators, political yeah. indicators. Maybe Dr. Schmetter's got some. Yeah. Well, Miles, before, what, maybe somebody from the audience has a question. It would be a good idea to allow some people, please, in the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. We keep comparing the numbers of dead people post and pre Saddam regime. But how long was this political instability? Were these people killed? What's the time span in comparison? Thirty years. Something that we're looking at now is we're looking at a great number of people <clears throat> being victimized in a very short period of time, and the political instability that preceded our intervention. The numbers are kind of close, but the time span was great. That's right. Saddam lasted on around 30 years. Uh, we're seeing uh, death rates now, or estimates of the number dead, uh, equal to what he had over 30 years. We're seeing that in three years, four years. And I have another quick question. Um, we've gone in and essentially destabilized the area, and we try, we're trying to create a democratic government that's friendly to all the groups of people, but inside the country, I think you have different nationalist movements. Like I think you see a lot of Kurdish nationalism still there, and you don't see that much evidence of Iraqi nationalism. No. It, all through the, you're absolutely right, all through the area of Kurdistan, I can tell you that journalists traveling in the area say they do not see a single indication that that entire region belongs in any way inside the country of Iraq, that it is part of Iraq. They don't see a single Iraqi flag, and this is an area of the world where flags really deeply matter, and you don't see any indication that there is a national government. Uh, you see maps up in official uh, offices of the government that describe Curtis, an area of Kurdistan that's actually much larger than the current Kurdistan, uh, including far more areas of Iraq that even Kurds think is ridiculous uh, in terms of the size that it's sort of shooting for. Uh, there has absolutely been this uh, uh, independent uh, Kurdish nationalism going on for uh, many, many years. Fortunately, by the way, in terms of destabilization, uh, like um, uh, Dr. Parkinson mentioned, uh, the, it looks like the Turks' relationship to Kurdistan, I might mention, uh, is uh, actually calming down a little bit. The Turks seem to be chilling a little. Uh, it's, it's no great, uh, mostly because they're getting the, uh, the Kurds under a little bit under control. They're starting to reach deals a little bit with the Kurds living inside of Turkey. Uh, so that Kurdish nationalism might hopefully not spill over uh, violently into uh, neighboring countries as well. But absolutely, there's no unifying Iraqi nationalism that to be found anywhere in Iraq other than literally a few politicians uh, who are on the fringe or represent relatively small communities, and literally, it is always noteworthy when they describe a, an Iraqi politician, they'll call him an Iraqi nationalist. Like that's something of note about this Iraqi politician in the national government. <laughs> it's like saying that, well, we have this Democratic Congress or this Republican Congress, and he actually believes in the United States. <laughs> and that's noteworthy. <laughs> uh, yeah. So absolutely right. The Kurds would most like to see radical federalism, if not independence. Radical federalism is where they have the most amount of autonomy and basically Baghdad cuts them a check. My final question, you mentioned possible independence. If, if the UN stepped in and created a Kurdistan, do you see it as being helpful to the area or do you think that that the vision that they have within themselves will just lead to another situation as we have now. The UN's never done anything. <laughs> They've never taken such a bold step. I mean, they aren't doing anything about Darfur. They didn't do anything about Rwanda. I mean, so I wouldn't have much faith in the UN doing anything. Sir, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I know if you want a doctor in Iraq or an engineer, you call New Zealand because most of them seem to live in our country now. So, uh, with the closure of the Catholic University and Catholic schools and those systems, because most of the Chaldean Orthodox people have come to New Zealand, what's been done to restore the intelligentsia, the expertise of these people, the professional people? I know there's a political gap, but there's 
Ain't much intelligence left there. Yeah, I think they had a brain drain. The brain drain, yes. Yeah. How's that going to be maybe not stemmed, but recreated within this mire, quagmire of... Well, if you were an Iraqi intellectual, would you stay in Iraq? <laughs> You're the person with the wherewithal and the means to leave. I think uh, what we're in now is, is just a transition period. Uh, eventually, this country will no longer be a country called Iraq. It will be uh, three different nations of Kurdistan, and depends on how the Turks feel about that, uh, and the people that are living in eastern Turkey, who are essentially Kurds, uh, a Shiite country and a Sunni country. And I think probably if the Americans weren't there, uh, and they had, in fact, deposed Saddam Hussein, uh, the Iraqis would, uh, they would gravitate to these three different places and they would create their own nation and a nation that, uh, nations that people very, uh, essentially believed in rather than this British mandate that occurred 80 years ago. There's one thing that I, uh, an opening there for me to mention something because I'd hate to actually have this entire uh, panel go by without mentioning it at least once. But the position of women in Iraqi society, particularly in the Shiite and Sunni dominated areas, which is the major, vast majority of the uh, population of the country, has declined rapidly as uh, more traditional and religious uh, approaches to the role of women in society have taken over as they're moving more towards very conservative uh, Sharia law. Uh, it is pushing women out of the workplace and back into the homes in a great deal, in a great variety of ways. You can say what you will about the brutality of Saddam Hussein's regime. It was a secular regime that's all reasonably agreed upon. And the position of uh, Arab women inside of uh, that society had uh, as much equality as probably any Western uh, uh, society would, could ask for, relatively speaking. Women were professionals out there in the economy working. Uh, those jobs, and they have lost a lot of those jobs since, uh, uh, because they've lost their ability to do that kind of work. It's not uniform, there are still women working in the, the workplace, that, but they also feel sometimes for their lives just by doing so. So it's an additional drain upon, the, uh, on this uh, professional class uh, that they no longer have uh, half of their, well, it's no longer half, I don't think it's an equal male-female ratio anymore in Iraq. Uh, due to deaths among men, uh, but uh, maybe even more than half of uh, their population uh, that they can draw on for that. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Has the invasion of Iraq, and I don't know if this can be monitored, has it made terrorist recruitment go down or up? Oh. Is there any way to measure it? Well, actually, our um, our own uh, our own intelligence services say that it's gone up tremendously. Am I right on that? Yeah. Okay. Our own government says it's up tremendously. Yes. Um, hasn't every time a dictator been removed, groups are splintered from the government? You know, i.e. all the Cromwell. You know, yeah. the Iron Revolt against England. Um, several. You know, every time a dictator has come to power and held power, just as soon as he was removed from power, hasn't traditionally in history groups of splintered after he was removed. And we haven't had enough time to measure if democracy is going to work in Iraq because it's only been X amount of years. It took America, what, 10, 15 years before we come together as a group and then of course we had no civil war. Has there been enough time? Has it? It's sort of a two-part question there. Yes, sir. Dictatorships automatically uh, lead to, you said, splintering. After they removed multiple groups taking right. over. I would have to say it depends on the case. A lot of times dictators are removed and you get a new dictator in, uh, of some kind, and he doesn't allow very much splintering. I would have to say when you uh, replace a democracy, you get the exact same thing. I think you're simply talking about a regime change of any kind. Won't you have some resistance to that? And absolutely, you will. Um, the question is whether or not uh, the, the reason why I was presenting what I did today the way I did was that you don't have a unified society of any real sort in which we are simply removing one style of government entirely and then putting in a new government on top of it. And then that government has to go through certain birth pains 
and it'll take time for them to work things out and everybody and it to develop legitimacy. Obviously, any uh, any new government needs time to uh, uh, to be seen as legitimate and uh, have the force of tradition behind it. But in Iraq, you don't have that unified society on which to put the new government. It was always a government that represented a segment, a power block, a actually <coughs> tribal and uh, uh, ideological block within society, and had to constantly fight and stand down all the other blocks that didn't want to be a part of Iraq in the first place 80 years ago, or this unified uh, country. Um, and so it's a much different question than can we just get this new government up and running? Because that government doesn't even really matter in a power sense. It matters for money and prestige. And there's a lot of stuff flowing through that government, obviously. Uh, but real power right now is held locally in the hands of uh, uh, these various disparate feuding groups all across the raft. And so it really isn't an issue of just sitting around and waiting for that government to start working, because it has no real power. The only person to really take power in that area was really Black Jack Virgil. I heard mm -hmm. more of him doing crazy things out there, but read several things, but he was the only one true all those people together, but he used violence, didn't he? Which, which people? Iraq. <laughs> Jack Virgil. Black Jack Virgil. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I, I don't know that many blocker. He, he, he couldn't even get Pancho Villa <laughs> in Mexico. So he never in Iraq is where they sent him to Europe. And he did pretty well. Well, look, on that note, I think it's a good note. We've had a tremendous program and discussion tonight. And I thank you all for, for your attendance and support, and have a, and the panels, especially for excellent programs. So thank you very much. SWTV, your campus and community connection.